This morning we're going to be in Acts chapter 3. You already knew that though, didn't you? Man, this is a fun one. You can go ahead and turn there. I am going to recap a little bit briefly on Acts chapter 2 because there's uh, some stuff that kind of helps roll right into uh, chapter 3. But before we do, I wanted to just tell you something that that uh, I was talking with God about on Friday. I, I was praying and, and just spending some time with Him and worship and stuff. And He reminded me of a story. I may have shared part of it with you before, but... Um, he brought back to my remembrance whenever I was, I think, like 15 or something. And my family lived way out in kind of the middle of nowhere, my favorite places to be. Um, we lived way out in the country, and no houses around, anything. I mean, our house was around, but nobody else's. And out back behind our house was a big field, and they would bale the hay and stuff, and it was a gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous summer day. I went out and I was up on top of this hay bale, just sitting there praising God for the the amazing weather. The weather was, have you ever been in the weather where like it, it just feels perfect? There's uh, uh, like there's no way to even describe it. You're like, this is the most perfect weather for me, you know? It, for me, it was perfectly clear skies. Um, I mean, some clouds a little bit, but the, the temperature was perfect. The breeze was perfect, and everything was just surreal. And I was just praying, and I was, I was thanking God for the day, and I just thought, it can't get any better than this. It, it literally can't get better. And so I asked God, I said, God, just, just take me now. Like, this is... This is so perfect, and I just, I want to be with you face to face with you. You know, that's the only thing that could make this day any better, is literally being face to face with him. Like, I felt his presence, all that stuff, but I just wanted to see him, and it was, it was so perfect. So I asked him to, to just take me home. And like I said, on Friday, I was, I was just praying and talking with God, and he reminded me of this time. He reminded me, took me right back to it. Have you ever smelled something? or heard something that just takes you right back into a moment? Well, that's what he did. He allowed me to just be right back in there, and he reminded me of me asking him to take me home. And he told me, he said, I didn't take you home because I wanted to share with you the blessings that I had for you of Brittany, of Trinity, Kyrie, Azrael, now my little granddaughter, Tinley. He said, those are my treasures and I wanted to share them with you. And I was just like, oh, that really hit home. And he said, I wanted to share them with you because you're my treasure too. And I mean, that's like, that's deep. But then he told me, he said, Nathan, I I reminded you of this so that you would tell my people that they are my treasure too. Too. So no matter how you're feeling today, I want to remind you that you are God's treasure. He views you as his own personal treasure. Think of that word treasure. It's precious. It's something that's just for you. And he's saying, you are just for me. And he wants to share that treasure. Man, I was just like, ever had those moments where God just floors you? (laughs) Uh, This is one of those moments, man. So, I want to recap Acts chapter 2 real quick. Just a couple spots. So in Acts chapter 2, verse 2, The word says that suddenly there was a sound from heaven, like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. It 
It says that it filled the house where they were sitting. There's 120 people in the upper room of this house in Jerusalem. These disciples, whenever they watch Jesus ascend into heaven, and he goes into that cloud, and, and if you guys, if you didn't listen to Pastor Rod's teaching on Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2, if you haven't heard it, go back online, listen to it. Those are two of what I feel like are probably his best teaching. I was just... I mean, I was talking to Azrael about it. I was talking, I'm just like, dang, these are awesome. So if you haven't heard them, please go back and listen to them. They're super, super good. So here's these, these 120 people filling this upper room. Must have been a pretty big house. They, they had just seen Jesus go up into heaven, being taken up into heaven, into this cloud. He, he ascends into a cloud. And like Rod said, it was it, it's not just like a big puffy cloud. It wasn't some cumulus cloud. It was probably the, um, like the Shekinah glory cloud. They're watching Jesus, and he enters into this Shekinah glory, this cloud. And they're just in awe of this. And then, boom, right in their midst are two men, two angels standing there in brilliant white. And there are multiple different types of angels. And some angels are like messenger angels. So if you remember whenever Jesus, um, whenever he rose on the third day, there were the angels in the bright white, like brilliant, dazzling white clothes that said, who are you looking for? He's not here. He's gone. Right? We remember those angels. Well, here's two angels standing in the midst of these guys saying, what are you looking for? <laughs> Just as Jesus was taken up, Right now, he's going to come back in the same way. He's going to come back in the same way. And we look at that part of the message, and it's just like, oh, cool, two, two guys are just standing in your midst. <laughs> no. Think about all the different times that angels met with people in the Bible. It would be astonishing. However, it would be paling in comparison to watching Jesus just rise up into the... <laughs> into the sky, you know. Some of those same people got to watch him walk on water, right? And now they're watching him rise up into heaven. But then there's these two angels, and they, and they, they talk to him a little bit, and they tell him what's up and, and everything. But Jesus had told them, he said, I want you to go back and wait. I want you to wait for something specific, though. So before that, before all this happens, remember whenever he told Peter, he said uh, his name was Simon, and, and then he changes his name to Peter. Well, the word was actually Petra. It was rock. That's where we get our word petrified from, right? But he tells him, he says, I'm going to change your name to rock because on this rock, I will build my church. He didn't say because... You're going to build my church. He said, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to build my church. You know, we always feel like that, that we've got to do it in our own power, and our own strength and all this stuff, but that's simply not the case. God will build his church. We just have to be the rock for him to build it on. Right? So <laughs> when Brittany and I were considerably younger, right before um, Trinity came along, we were going to a, uh, a Team Extreme show. I used to be on this uh, like power team type thing. And we were, we were driving along, and this show that we were going to be at, the music group, Petra, was actually going to be there as well. Well, a friend of ours, I'm not going to mention his, I'm not going to say his actual name, but he's from another country, and he's got this great accent. And, but he says, Petra? Who's Petra? And we were just busting up laughing, you know, because back then Petra was a pretty big deal. But um, I just, I always, every time I think of Peter being the rock and Petra, you know. Anyway, I digress. But in, uh, in chapter 2, verse 14, well, before that, they're all, they're all back in this upper room and the Holy Spirit falls. And they get baptized in the Holy Spirit. 
Well, just like Rod said, there's a big difference between receiving the Holy Spirit and being baptized in the Holy Spirit. All of, all of these have already received the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was on um, the mount with them, the Word says that He breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. So at that moment, they received the Holy Spirit. Jesus breathed on them and they received it. But before Jesus is, is taken up into heaven, He says, Go and wait. It says, until you receive the gift that my Father will give. This gift was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Baptism in the Holy Spirit brings a whole nother level of power. It changes everything. It literally changes everything. And that's why I love the book of Acts here, because it shows it. So we've got Peter, that Jesus said, I'm going to build my church on you. And then they're in this upper room. The Holy Spirit literally descends on them, in them, through them. They're baptized in the Holy Spirit. They start speaking in tongues. Lots of different languages, right? All this kind of stuff. That's not the only power that comes with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? And even Rod told us his testimony of how he, he believed that, you know, he had the Holy Spirit and all that stuff, and, and it was even later that he received the gift of tongues. It's just one of the gifts that comes along with it. There's so many other powerful gifts that come with being baptized in the Holy Spirit. This specific one, they're talking about tongues and everything, but I want to point out some of the other power that came along with it. So if you look at 2 verse 14, chapter 2 verse 14, it says that Peter stepped forward with the other 11 disciples. So when he goes to give this message, he's been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and now he's stepping out in power along with the 11 other disciples and probably everybody else is coming out, right? And he starts delivering this message. He's delivering a message without fear. After Jesus was crucified, everyone was hiding. Remember, he would show up in the rooms where the doors were shut and locked because they were afraid. The Romans and the, the Pharisees and Sadducees just murdered their best friend because he was who he was, right? Peter had denied Jesus because he was afraid that he was going to be murdered as well. And he probably would have been, you know? But now, now they have the power of the Holy Spirit who has emboldened them to do what God has called them to do, what Jesus told them to do. And they're stepping out and doing it. They are stepping out and doing it. Not in fear, in acceptance of whatever comes through the power of God. Because the Word says that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. That means we can even overcome our fear of failure, our fear of rejection, our fear of any. We can overcome that through Him. All right? And, and they're clearly showing that. But then it says in verse 2, it says, Suddenly this sound came in the house. But it, it says that it was such a mighty sound from heaven that if you look a little bit farther down, where was it? I think it was 2.23. No, it wasn't. It was verse 6. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running. So people from all around heard this noise of what happened in this house. It was the mighty sound from heaven that drew their attention. And then they start hearing the people speaking in tongues and all that. And then Peter delivers this message that wins 3,000 people over to Christianity. That's pretty impressive because literally a month and a half earlier, Jesus was just tortured and murdered in front of everybody's eyes. But 500 people saw him alive and well after that. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? There's a lot, there's a lot there, but anyway. Anyway. 
I'm going to read you chapter 3 real quick. Then we're going to dissect it. The reason I'm reading all the way through is because if I just start dissecting it without the whole picture, it might seem a little odd, okay? So just bear with me. If you want to follow in your Bibles, you can, but sometimes whenever I, I'm trying to follow and maybe somebody's using a different version, it throws me all off and my mind goes everywhere, but your mind might not do that, but mine does. So here we are. It, chapter 2 ends where Peter was giving this message, right? And all these people come to the full knowledge. But then in chapter 3, this is later on, it says, Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the 3 o'clock prayer service. Kind of like what we're going to have next Wednesday. It says, they approached the temple and a man who was lame from birth was being carried in. Every day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, Look at us. The lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Then, walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. All the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. When they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. They all rushed out in amazement to, the, to Solomon's colonnade where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. Peter saw his opportunity and addressed the crowd. People of Israel, he said, what is so surprising about this? And why stare at us as though we had made this man walk by our own power or godliness? For it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the God of all our ancestors, who has brought glory to His servant Jesus by doing this. This is the same Jesus whom you handed over and rejected before Pilate, despite Pilate's decision to release Him. You rejected this holy, righteous one and instead demanded the release of a murderer. You killed the author of life. But God raised Him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this fact. Through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed, and you know how crippled he was before. Faith in Jesus' name has healed him before your very eyes. Friends, I realize that what you and your leaders did to Jesus was done in ignorance, but God was fulfilling what all the prophets had foretold about the Messiah, that he must suffer these things. Now... Repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord, and He will again send you Jesus, your appointed Messiah. For He must remain in heaven until the time for the final restoration of all things, as God promised long ago through His holy prophets. Moses said, the Lord your God will rise up for you, a prophet like me, from among your own people. Listen carefully to everything he tells you. When Moses said, anyone who will not listen to that prophet will be completely cut off from God's people. Starting with Samuel, every prophet spoke about what is happening today. You are the children of those prophets, and you are included in the covenant God promised to your ancestors. For God said to Abraham, through your descendants, all the families of the earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant Jesus, he sent him first 
to you, people of Israel, to bless you by turning each of you back from your sinful ways. That's a pretty powerful message. Let's look at, start back at the beginning though. Okay, Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. So they go back into the temple. Even though a little bit later he addresses all the people and their leaders who killed Jesus, who know very well that these people follow Jesus, but they still go to the temple to worship God. They no longer in fear that something's going to happen to them. In fact, they probably know pretty sure that something's going to happen to them at some point. But they, they don't let that dissuade them from doing what they know they need to be doing. They're going and taking part in a three o'clock prayer service. Prayer in church has always been important. We can pray at home. I've got my prayer closet. I've got my time that I personally spend with the Lord. But guys, there is a power that comes from corporate prayer. That's why the word says where two or more are gathered together, there he is in your midst. I could go on and on about stories of things that have happened through prayer. But then it goes on and it talks about this, this beggar. He was, he was lame from birth. And they, people took him every day to set him at the gates of the temple to be able to ask for money. Because he couldn't work, right? They didn't take him up to the tax collector's booth. They didn't take him to the, to the city gates. They took him to the temple. Because the people at the temple that are going in and out of the temple should have love in their heart, should have compassion in their heart, mercy on people that are God's, you know, God created them. And at this point, you know, think about what would we do if we showed up to church every day and there was a beggar that was there every Sunday, just sitting out there begging for money, asking for money. Have you ever passed somebody on a street corner begging? You know, um, I'm sure that we have. And a lot of times, what do we do? We like, we like look straight forward or we try to fiddle with the radio or something. We don't want to make eye contact with them. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to call somebody out. I'm saying this is kind of, you know, these are all things that, have, that I've dealt with, you know. But remember, remember how Jesus said that we're all his treasure. Even those people, he loves them very, very much. This guy's placed out there in front of the church door to beg for money. It said that he had been placed there all the time. How many times had they gone past him? Jesus probably walked past him. Jesus went in and out of the temple all the time. Jesus didn't heal him. Is that not interesting? He didn't heal everybody. Like, look at, the, look at the person that was blind whenever he was coming out of the temple one day. He sees this blind person. And the, the disciples ask him, why is, this, why is he blind? Was it his sins or his parents' sins? You know, Jesus said it wasn't either of those. People don't always have an ailment because of their sinful life. They've got an ailment because they live in this world. That one in particular person, though, he was born blind, had to be blind his whole life for one moment in time. And that was for Jesus to heal his blindness. Jesus said that's why he was born blind. That's why he's been blind and he's suffered this his entire life. So I could do this right now. So I could prove this point to you. Does that give you a different perspective on sometimes when you suffer? Maybe God wants to do a miracle in you or to you, or through you, or for you. This guy, he's sitting there. Everybody knew him. Everybody recognized him. 
and then Peter and John, they look at him intently, intently, with purpose. You know what I mean? Like, like it, we might turn our heads from, from a beggar. He sees people walking in, and he starts talking, asking them for money, and they look at him. They look into him. He probably didn't have a lot of people look at him. A lot of people that didn't want to give him anything didn't want to look at him. So they walked right on by. But they stopped and they looked intently at him. And Peter's like, I got this new power that God gave me as a gift. And he says, I don't have money to give you, but I do have this. Get up and walk. I'm going to give you what I have, and what I have is the power to heal this. So get up and walk. He doesn't say this long priestly prayer or something, does he? No. He said a few short words. What I have I give you, get up and walk in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus told him, anything that you ask for in my name and believe that you'll receive, you will have it. So he tells him, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. But then, look at what Peter did then. It says, then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, so Peter grabs this, this lame guy's hand and starts picking him up before he ever sees anything happen to him. Before he knows this guy can walk. He just spoke it out and he grabs him, picks him up, and expects him to be healed. He has an absolute expectation this guy's legs are going to be healed. And so he grabs him and he starts picking him up. It says he grabbed him by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. As he did. Not before he did, but as he did. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. But not only did he just like walk and start trying this out because it's literally the first time he's ever walked in his whole life. But it says he stands up and he can instantly walk. <laughs> Motion sickness. <laughs> he stands up and he walks, but not only does he walk, it said he stood on his feet, began to walk, and then walking, leaping, and praising God. He's jumping around. Wouldn't you be? You had to have somebody carry you to church so that you could beg for, from people your whole life. Now all of a sudden, whoop, you can walk, you can jump, you can run, and he starts praising God, right? And it draws attention. People start seeing this. People are coming out. They're like, wait a minute. I bet there were some people in the crowd that came out of the church saying, that guy's been out there acting like he's been crippled his whole life just to get some money. I gave him money three years ago. I, I mean, I can't, it's not in the word. I'm just saying it, it may have happened, right? They're seeing this and, and so many people are just absolutely amazed. They're astonished. They're absolutely astonished at what's going on here. And it was this simple Short, belief-filled, trusting, faithful prayer. They had seen Jesus do it before. God had sent, Jesus had sent them out, remember, to go witness and, and heal sick and, and all this kind of stuff. But now they have this new power that's flowing through them, absolute fearless, and they're doing it in the same place with the same people that killed Jesus. I think it's pretty awesome. But then whenever all the people see and hear him praising God, when they realize that it was that same person that they had seen so often, they were astounded. They all rush out to see him, right? This faith, whenever they stepped out, they got to experience what God wanted for them. They no longer were just watching Jesus do something. They were active participants in God's plan for their life. 
But what if? What if they would have just walked right past this dude? He would have still been sitting there begging, probably for the rest of his life. But they were obedient to the call. They had that, that guiding of the Holy Spirit that said, hey, stop, look at this guy. The Holy Spirit does that with us. I've experienced it on multiple occasions where he said, stop, look at this person, pray for that person, talk to that person, help that person, whatever it is. If you're willing to listen, he's willing to talk. And if you're willing to do, he's willing to work through you. I love that this guy was holding tightly to them. It said tightly, this, this action word. He wasn't just like, just bouncing around all, all wild and crazy. He started like holding on to them. Like, I need more of this. I want more of this. Well, what happens whenever people start seeing miracles? They start seeing signs and wonders. What happened with Jesus? Jesus. People are coming out of the woodwork all over the place. They're going all the way around the sea just to get to them. They're hanging out in the middle of nowhere with no food or no anything just to talk to them. That's what happens. That's the whole reason that God gives us the ability to work signs, miracles, wonders. It's not for us to get some praise and glory. It's for God to get the glory so that they can step into an intimate, personal relationship with Him. It gets their attention. It gets attention not about us it's not about the sign and wonder it's not about the miracle it's about the god that does the miracle because you're his treasure and they're his treasure and he wants them to know he cares that's why life's but a vapor it's here today and gone tomorrow it, if we're crippled the whole time oh well it's just here today and gone tomorrow if we get hurt if we suffer whatever it's just for a teeny tiny moment in all of time, in all of eternity. We're not going to have the problems that we have right now in heaven. I promise you, we're not. There's not any heart, heartache. There's no sorrow. There's no tears. There's no cry. There's none of that stuff for the rest of eternity. God wants to use these things to draw people to himself. And look what happened. All these people start coming out. And all these people start getting ministered to and they start realizing that jesus the one that they actually killed is the true god the real god here's what i love about peter peter sees his opening he sees all these people coming out peter had just preached a message that was pretty pretty tough for a lot of people to hear but 3,000 people came in to a relationship with Jesus after he gave it. So now he's seeing all these people come out into Solomon's colonnade, this open area right there at the door of the, of the temple. And he sees, he's like, all right, now's the time, baby. Now's the time. So he starts to minister to them, right? And something that I find really interesting is he addresses the crowd two different ways. When he starts, he says, People of Israel. That's what he says in verse 12. If you go down to verse 17, after he lays into them pretty hard, he calls them friends. He starts out, people of Israel, you did this, 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 and this. And then he says friends. Isn't that just like what Peter got to experience Jesus do to him and the rest of the disciples on many occasions? He came at them with the, with the truth, and it was hard, and sometimes the truth's hard to hear. But we need to hear it. We can't not hear it, because if we don't hear it, we're not going to change. And he knows if they don't hear it, they're not going to change, but he tells them the truth in love. He gives them the cold, hard truth. You were wrong. We're all wrong. We've all been wrong. The Word says that all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us. And even our most righteous deeds are as filthy rags. And none of us are worthy, not even one, the Word says, but by God's grace, because of the sacrifice that He gave. That makes us worthy. That makes them worthy if they're willing to repent. 
So here's what he tells them. He goes on and he start, he's telling them of, about all the things that they did. And, and he's telling them, don't look at me. Don't look at, at us like we did something amazing and outstanding. What did he tell the, the beggar, though? He said, look at us. Why would he tell them to look at him? Well, because if somebody's lowly and begging, generally they feel shame. They feel not worthy. So they're not going to look, you know, so he's sticking the cup out or whatever, begging, not, not feeling worthy enough to look. And Peter says, look at us, look at us. And he did. Well, then now he's got this whole crowd of people around that are like, what did you do? This is amazing. And Peter says, don't look at us. He's not taking the glory for himself. He says, this is only because of the power that was given to us by God the Father through faith in Jesus Christ, the one you murdered. That guy, yeah, remember him? The author of life? <laughs> the one that made you, you killed. You and your leaders. He didn't just, didn't just point them out. He says, you and your leaders. God the Father the God of your ancestors, the ones that you guys believe in so, so strongly about, and we do too. The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our forefathers, the God of Moses, the God who split the Red Sea. He's the one that sent Jesus that you killed. He's the one that exalted Jesus, and it's by that Jesus' name that this guy can walk doesn't have anything to do with me doesn't have anything to do with him we're just the vessels you guys rejected jesus and even Pilate was trying to set him free he made the decision to set him free and you refused it and you killed him anyway but god raised him from the dead. You killed him. You tried to snuff out his life. But God raised him from the dead. And it's the God that's living right now that made this guy walk. But here's, here's something really awesome. He says, through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed. Through faith in the name of Jesus. That faith is a big part there. It plays a massive, massive part in this. Smith Wigglesworth. Anybody ever heard of Smith Wigglesworth? No. <laughs> this dude, if you haven't heard of him, you really should look him up. He died in like 1949 or something like that. But We have a book here at church. We will have it back here at church again. I'm using it right now. But uh, it is Smith Wigglesworth on healing. This guy had this healing ministry where he would do the most outrageous things. Like if somebody had a tumor in their stomach or something, he'd walk up, punch them in the stomach. <laughs> he'd take dead people out of their bed and throw them up against a wall and say, stand. And they'd... And he'd grab them, boom, throw them back up against the wall. Stand in Jesus' name. And then they, burp, they come back to life. I mean, documented account after account after account. This dude did the most crazy things. But he was just doing whatever God told him to do. You know, remember Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud, rubbed it in a dude's eye, like, and he could see again? It's not out of the ordinary. Like, God doesn't do everything the way that we think that he should. And Smith, like, he took it seriously, like he took him literally, <laughs> you know. But uh, he says that as we're talking about this faith, he says that we're saved by grace through faith, right? We're saved by grace through our faith. You can't please God without faith. You can't. It's impossible.
If we want to be able to see signs and miracles and all these things in order for God to get the glory, then we have to open the door through faith. Faith is that door that opens that, right? Faith that he is who he says he is, that he's going to do what he says he's going to do. This is, is believing. Faith is believing, but most people want healing by a feeling, Smith says. And if you think about it, they want healing through a feeling. I feel like I should do this. I feel like I should do that. It's got to be done in faith. Some people want salvation the same way too, right? They want salvation through this feeling instead of through faith, believing that they've received it. John 20, 29, Jesus said to Thomas, blessed are those who believe that haven't seen. So many people want to see before they're going to believe. Like the Pharisees, show us a sign. Jesus said, you perverse and unbelieving, wicked generation. You just want signs. You don't want me. You just want signs. It's selfishness. That's what it is. God help us to set aside our own thoughts and feelings for His truth. In verse 17, he goes back and he calls them friends, okay? He says, I realize what you and your leaders did to Jesus was done in ignorance. You didn't realize. You didn't realize what you were doing. That's why Jesus, while he's hanging on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. That means they did it in ignorance. And Peter says, you guys just didn't know. You didn't know what you were doing. You did it in ignorance. But let me tell you what you need to know now. He says, but God was fulfilling what all the prophets had foretold about the Messiah. That he must suffer these things. There are so many signs. There are so many prophetic uh, words about Jesus. He says that every single one of the prophets foretold Jesus coming. All of them did. You just didn't realize that that's what he was saying. You know, and, and I heard a, a pastor say, and I wonder if it was Rod. It might have been Rod. Saying that if, if Satan would have known what he was doing, he would have never done it. He literally... <laughs> He literally caused his own failure. He would have never crucified him because that was the plan from the very beginning. Something I wrote down here says, Miracles provide opportunities to lead people to the knowledge, to knowledge and relationship with their Creator. If you won't take the opportunity to share Christ's love with people, don't expect to see the miracles you're asking for. I love how Peter, as he's, he's laying all this stuff out for, for these people that he's ministering to, that he's witnessing to right here, which is thousands of people, okay? There are literally thousands of people that he's talking to that are coming around to hear all this. He lets them know that you need to repent of your sins. Turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Then times of refreshment will come. So he lays out, here's what you did wrong. You did it in ignorance, and it can be corrected. I don't want you to sit here and wallow in, in sorrow and self-pity thinking, oh my gosh, we did something unforgivable. Because it's not unforgivable. Jesus said, you can do pretty much anything against me, and you will still be forgiven of it. But don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. You're going to have a big problem there. But he tells them that beforehand, I think, personally for this time. Because how bad would you feel 
if you're coming to the full realization that what you did, screaming out, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, was the author of life, you would be shocked to the core, I'm sure. And just like back in chapter 2, they said, brothers, what should we do? You know, and back in chapter 2, Peter says, repent of your sins, confess your sins, believe in God, be baptized, be saved. He gives, he lays this out for them. Super, super awesome. He lays it out for them. And he does the same thing here with these guys. But um, I love what he says, how he says that restoration, that God's going to bring restoration of all things. God promised long ago through the holy prophets, Moses said that he will raise up for you. He's talking about all of us, a prophet like me, Moses said. And if you think about it, if you break down... Um, the whole story of Moses, how he was sent out into the wilderness, how he became the Savior, how he led people into the promised land. Like there's so many, um, so many connections between him and Jesus. The same with like Joseph and all these people, but that's why he can say a prophet like me because he's, he's the Savior of these people. But he says, listen carefully to everything that he tells you. Moses tells them that if we don't listen carefully to Jesus, if we don't do what he says, he says that they will be completely cut off from God's people. It's possible to be cut off from God's people. A lot of people don't believe that. A lot of people don't want to believe that. A lot of people believe that there's a heaven, but they don't believe there's a hell. That's true. That People literally believe that. Not that there's no hell, that's not true. But they actually believe that. And so people need to know that. I'm not, I'm not trying to be a, a fire and brimstone preacher or something. But you've got to know that there's two sides to this coin. You get to choose. And your choice is what makes the difference. You either believe or you don't. You're either in or you're out. There's no in the middle. Like you were talking about, walking on that fence. He owns the fence. Satan owns the fence. If you're on the fence, he owns that fence. You got to be in. You can't be, um, you can't be lukewarm. Nope. And think that you're going to skate by. It doesn't work that way. But he tells us that we are included in the covenant God promised to your ancestors. But I love down here in verse... 26, it said, when God raised up his servant Jesus, he sent him first to you people of Israel. The Israel, uh, Israelis are actually God's chosen people. We, I don't know, is there any um, Israelis in here? Israelites? No? But we all get grafted into that. He's provided the way for all of us as well. He says, why did he, why did he come first to them? To bless you. And then how does he bless them? By turning each of you back from your sinful ways. So Peter gives this message. Peter and John. John's right there with him, right? He gives this message. I'm going to read the first paragraph of chapter 4 so we can see what happened after this outstanding message. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priests, the captain of the temple guard, who went with the priests to go capture Jesus. The captain of the temple guard and a lot of soldiers. They came, and some of the Sadducees came along with them. So there was Pharisees and Sadducees. The leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus there is resurrection of the dead. So they arrested them. They arrested them, and since it was already evening, they put them in jail until morning. But many of the people who heard their message believed it, so the number of men who believed now totaled about 5,000 people. Peter gives this awesome message. 3,000. Then he goes to the temple. God heals this guy. He gives another message, pretty short and simple. 
but it's kind of rough. He gives them a way out. And another 2,000 people are like, I will take that way out. Thank you very much. So, he's got a, a miraculous healing at the temple. 2,000 people decide to follow Jesus Christ because of his message that day. That's a victory, right? You're all pumped up. And then you get arrested and you spend the night in jail for it. That very day. That very day. There's a cost to following Jesus. There's a price that we will pay physically here in this world. If you want to follow him, there will be trials and tribulations. There will be power that comes along with it. There will be life-changing things that happen. You will see people literally snatched out of hell that were going to hell. You will change their lives for eternity. But in this world, it's not all going to be roses. It's not going to be you get anything and everything you want. You're going to be rich. You're going to be wealthy. You get to name it and claim it and have all this stuff. That's not biblical. It's just not. Most, all but one of the, the actual disciples were literally brutally murdered for it. They were imprisoned all the time. They had to pay for it. And guys, if we're doing it right, we're going to have to pay for it. Are you willing to pay for it? Are you willing to pay the price to sacrifice Whatever it takes to sacrifice for God's treasures. To give back to God His treasures. To lead His treasures into a relationship with Him. There's probably coming a time where me preaching this from this pulpit will end me up in, in jail. I've told you that before. And if you're willing to be bold and step out and allow God to work through you with the power of the Holy Spirit, and it will probably end you up in jail too. You'll be falsely accused. You'll be ridiculed. You'll be called a bigot. You'll be called all kinds of names. Eventually, it's going to come here. It's all over the world. What did I tell you, Michael? The other day, there was like 140-some people over in Africa on Christmas Eve yeah, in Nigeria, right? In, in these multiple different villages, the most amount of people killed there because they were Christians since like 2018, there was literally like 150 people that were shot down, that were hacked to death with machetes, Christmas Eve, hacked to death with machetes, beaten, raped, tortured, killed, Ran out of town this Christmas Eve, last week. For their faith in Jesus Christ, the one that we're talking about today. We are naive to think that it won't come here. People have been getting murdered for the last 2,000 years for the name of Jesus Christ. This isn't for the weak of heart. Is for the bold. Rod talked about um, home groups and stuff, and we've been we've been talking about that quite a bit. We've got to be starting starting back home groups. I mean, we just do. We can't expect the world to just come in here. They can't just get fed here. We've got to be starting home groups. We've got to be that example. Uh, there's a ministry that Church on the Rock is going to be taking part in. And actually, the last I heard, nine churches in Harrisonville were locked in. Several more are still thinking about it, but it's, it's going to be called an Adopt a Street Initiative. Um, some of our friends over at Harrisonville Community Church have had the idea to adopt streets. So Church on the Rock would take a block, like not a, a block, a city block, 
to like a, a section of Harrisonville, and that would be our section. And we would get to literally adopt a street. So the Briggs family will take Smith Street or whatever, right? And, and we would start praying for everybody on that street. We would start going door to door and actually just generating relationship with them. Not like immediately open the door, hey, if you died today, do you know where you're going? Not like that, but, but starting to love on them and ministering to them by our actions, right? And then slowly developing those relationships, building these relationships and being able to invite them to come to church too, you know? But it starts with relationship. That's why God said the greatest two commandments are to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love others as ourselves. You know, drawing people into him. It's his, his um, kindness that leads us to repentance. Right? So we get an opportunity to do that. Um, Brittany and I are going to be helping lead that here in our church. And um, so that's going to be kicking off the beginning of the year. We've got the night of prayer coming up. The Wednesday nights. I know Rod talked about it. Steve talked about it. It's, it's super, super important, guys. When we pray, things change. When we pray, things happen. I just read back through Revelations. Love Revelations, but it talks multiple times about what your prayers are doing in the courts of heaven. <laughs> super awesome. But if any of you uh, today are feeling like God is prompting you to uh, repent, come up. Like, uh, believe me, there's literally nothing you can tell me that's going to make me go, what in the world? Nope. I've been too far down road, uh, life's roads for that. Okay. If you feel like uh, you need to repent, come up. We'll talk about it personally. I'm not going to spread your stuff around. If you feel like you need healing, come up. If you want baptized, let us know. We'll do baptisms, probably not today because the baptismal isn't ready. But if you're like, I want baptized today, I'll baptize you today. I don't care. We'll go somewhere. We'll make it happen. But this journey through Acts is going to be pretty stinking awesome. I love Acts, and it, it gets pretty deep. So let's, uh, let's pray. Whenever um, I get done praying, we'll, we'll have some music going. We'll have some ministry time up here. If you want to spend some time uh, being prayed over, that's fine. If you just want to pray yourself, that's totally fine too. But um, yeah, I hope today ministered to you. All right. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that we are your treasures, that you view us as treasures. God, I thank you that you want us to view ourselves as your treasures. You don't want us to think poorly of ourselves. I think that hurts your heart. Lord, help us to view ourselves the way that you view us. God, help us to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Help us to walk in your power and in your might, accomplishing everything for your name. Not for our glory, Lord, but for yours. Help us to be world changers, God. Help us to change the world around us. Help us to be obedient to what it is that you call us to do, Lord. May we decrease so that you can increase. God, go before us. Go before us, Lord, and prepare the way for us. Help us as we, as we go through our life this week. Give us divine appointments and opportunities to show people your love, your kindness, God. Your treasures. And we pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.